السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه All praise belong to Allah we ask him to shower his peace, blessings, and mercy upon our dear and beloved Prophet Muhammad, his family, companions, followers, and upon all of us gathered here in his blessed house. Ameen, Allahumma Ameen. And upon all those who are watching from home or elsewhere, Ameen. Uh, before I begin, I would like to ask the brothers to please come to this side of the masjid. And if you'd like, don't be shy, grab a chair. It, uh, sitting on the floor for a long period of time may be a little difficult. So don't uh, shy away from grabbing a chair and sitting down. And for the sisters, you may come forward if you choose to, and uh, you can sit in the front. It's your choice. But if you would like, you're more than welcome to do so on this side of the masjid, insha'Allah ta'ala. <clears throat> you are honorable guests of Allah. We all are in his blessed house. And soon, insha'Allah ta'ala, you all will be super honorable guests of Allah in his super special blessed house. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. This evening's program is about Hajj. And what I would like to do is do the best we can in the limited time that we have. We have a little over an hour to cover a very broad and deep topic. But inshallah ta'ala, I will do my very best inshallah ta'ala to cover as much as possible. I would suggest for those who haven't gone to Hajj, how many people are registered for Hajj this year? Raise your hand. You're registered. You've paid. You're almost promised a visa. Raise your hand. طيب. May Allah accept and make it easy. How many people have never gone to Hajj and they would like to go to Hajj this year? This year. MashaAllah. May Allah make it easy and accept. How many people have future plans to go to Hajj? MashaAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of us. Amen. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن أول بيت وضع للناس للذي ببكة مباركا وهدى للعالمين Indeed, the first house of worship for human beings has been the one in Bekkah, which is another name in Mecca. Blessed it is and guidance for all people. In it are very clear signs. One is the station of Ibrahim, where you see his footprints. وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا And anyone who enters into it is at peace and must never be harmed. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا And it is a right of Allah on people to perform hajj to that house for those who can afford to do so. And I will explain what that means. And one who defies and disobeys and disbelieves, Allah needs none of his creation. Subhana. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa once was asked, 
What are the most beloved deeds? What are the best deeds? أي الأعمال أفضل؟ قال صلى الله عليه وسلم إيمان بالله ورسوله To believe in Allah, the oneness of Allah and his messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم قيل ثم ماذا? And then he was asked, what else is really the best? He said, jihad في سبيل الله The struggle in the way of Allah قيل ثم ماذا? He was asked, what else? He said, حج مبرور An accepted حج والحج المبرور هو الذي لا يخالطه إث How do you know what a حج مبرور is? It is one that you don't commit sins while you're performing your حج So after paying sometimes upwards of $20,000 per person and taking your very precious vacation time traveling halfway if not more across the world exerting immense effort don't waste all of that because of a moment or two that you become impatient don't so hajj mabrur should not have sin with it and the second al hasan al basri rahimahullah he says an yarji'a zahidan fi ad dunya raghiban fi al akhirah another sign of an accepted hajj is for the pilgrim to go back not so indulged in dunya and they're seeking akhirah much more they're seeking akhirah which means you can use the dunya you have and you should to earn your akhirah and another hadith says an birrahu it'am at'am wa lin al kalam that a, another sign of hajj mabrur is that you come back wanting to feed, share food, feed all the hungry, all the friends, all the neighbors. You just want to, mashallah, be very generous feeding others and to be very kind in your words. Kind with your words. Very kindly spoken. Walinu al-kalam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam said, Jihadu al-kabiri. He said, hajj is, Jihad al kabiri wal da'ifi wal mar'at al hajj. He said, Hajj is the jihad of the elderly, the jihad of the weak and fragile, and jihad of a woman, and jihad of the ladies. These, this hajj is the hajj for all three elderly, the weak and fragile, and the ladies. This is considered, hajj is considered their jihad. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guides the authorities of hajj to open it for the elderly as Rasulullah sallallahu here says, it is jihad al-kabir. This means the elderly should be able and eligible to go to hajj regardless. And therefore, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide the decision makers to open the hajj for above 65 years of age as many people have not performed hajj and they're older than 65. May Allah accept our dua. The Prophet ﷺ also said to Aisha radiallahu anha as she asked. She said, Ya Rasulullah, tara al-jihad afdal al-amal, afala nujahid? She said, O Messenger of Allah, you see, jihad is the best of actions or deeds. Can we women, in other words, do jihad with you? The Prophet ﷺ said to her, لَكُنَّ أَفْضَلُ الْجِهَادِ For you is the best of jihad, حَجٌ مبرور. An accepted hajj. So that's the form of jihad for the ladies. As it is recorded in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by our beloved mother Aisha رضي الله عنها وأرضاها. And her response to this, listen to the believing woman's response. She said, فَلَا أَدَعُ الْحَجَّ بَعْدَ إِذْ سَمِعْتُ هَذَا مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So she said, after hearing this from the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, I never let go of or stopped going to hajj. Since hearing that, she continued to do hajj. And that's the response of all believers. سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We listened to you, O Allah, and your Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, and we obeyed. May Allah make us among them. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَمَنْ حَجَّ فَلَا يَرْفُثُ أو مَنْ حَجَّ فَلَمْ يَرْفُثُ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقُ 
رجع كيوم ولدته أمه. He said one who performs Hajj and they do not engage in foul or vulgar language nor behaviors, they will return back sin free the way the day like the day they were born. And one day when Amr ibn al-As, the great companion radiallahu anhu, decided to embrace Islam, he he says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in my heart to accept Islam, I approached the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to give him bay'ah. So I extended my hand and he extended his. And as soon as the Prophet sallallahu extended his hand for me to shake it, I retreated my hand. I retracted my hand. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Ma laka ya Amr? What's the matter, Amr? He said, I would like ashtariq. He said, I'd like to have conditions. The Prophet ﷺ said, تَشْتَرِطُ ماذا? What conditions do you have? He says, that Allah forgive me. And the Prophet ﷺ responded to him and said, أَمَا تَعْأَمَا عَلِمْتَ أَنَّ الْإِسْلَامَ يَهْدِمُ مَا قَبْلَهُ وَأَنَّ الْهِجْرَةَ تَهْدِمُ مَا قَبْلَهَا وَأَنَّ الْحَجَّ يَهْدِمُ مَا قَبْلَهَا The Prophet ﷺ said, didn't you know or don't you know that Islam forgives all sin that was committed before entering into it, before embracing it. All sins committed before embracing Islam, Allah forgives the person once they embrace Islam. And he said, and anyone who performed hijrah, migrated from Mecca to Medina during the time of the Prophet Sallam, Allah forgave all their sins pre-hijrah, pre pre-migration. And hajj forgives all the sins before it. So hajj erases all the sins before it. I would like to just clarify one point that it forgives all the sins, all the sins performed before it, except if you owe someone a property or possession that you wrongfully took. You must give that back. In order for Allah to forgive you entirely, Hajj, Allah, Allah may forgive and inshallah He will forgive all of your sins, whatever you made mistakes. But if you wrongfully took someone else's property or possession, that you need to return. The Prophet ﷺ said, I love this hadith in particular, تَابِعُوا بَيْنَ الْحَجِّ وَالْعُمْرَةِ فَإِنَّهُمَا يَنْفِيَانِ الْفَقْرَ وَالذُّنُوبِ كَمَا يَنْفِي الْكِيرُ خَبَثَ الْحَدِيدِ وَالذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَالْحَجَّةُ الْمَبْرُورَةِ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ وَالْحَجُّ الْمَبْرُورِ لَيْسَ لَهُ جَزَاءٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ Prophet ﷺ said, repeatedly perform Hajj and Umrah. Doing so will get your sins forgiven and will purify you and will get rid of, of poverty. Will get rid of sin and poverty the way fire purifies iron, gold, and silver. And an accepted Hajj has no less reward than Jannah. And an accepted Hajj has no less reward than Jannah. Another beautiful hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, prepare yourself mentally and emotionally. The Prophet ﷺ said, الحجاج والعمار وفد الله إن دعوه أجابهم وإن استغفروه غفر لهم Those who are going to perform Hajj and Umrah are the special guests of Allah. If they ask him, he will answer them. If they seek his forgiveness, he will forgive them. They ask him, he will respond to them. And if he seeks, if they seek his forgiveness, he will forgive them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, العمرة إلى العمرة كفارة لما بينهما والحج المبرور ليس له جزاء إلا الجنة. He said, عمرة عمرة, Allah forgives all that's in between. So this is a question that may come to your mind. What do I get for Umrah? Prophet ﷺ said here, Umrah to Umrah, Allah forgives all that's in between. Umrah is a mini hajj that has, mashallah, many blessings, including forgiveness of sin. And an accepted hajj, the Prophet ﷺ says, will have no less reward than Jannah. Is it a big deal? Now do you realize a bit? It's a big deal. You get people that take it kind of in a very uh, nonchalant attitude. They're just laid back at hajj, eh, hajj. No. 
Hajj is a pillar of Islam, one of the five pillars of Islam, if you can afford to do so financially, physically, and it's safe to travel. So don't take it lightly if you can afford to do so. And especially if you're young, and we'll talk about that. And the Prophet ﷺ explained, هذا البيت دعامة الإسلام فمن خرج يا أم هذا البيت أي يقصد هذا البيت من حج أو معتمر كان مضمونا على الله أن إن قبضه أن يدخله الجنة وإن رده رده بأجر وغنيمة. Prophet ﷺ said, this house of Allah is a place for believers to go to. And he says, anyone who makes the intention of coming to this house, meaning for Hajj or Umrah, and they happen to die on their way, Allah will give them Jannah. And if Allah gives them life and returns them back to their family, Allah will return them with immense rewards and blessings. How about those $20,000 you're paying and all, this, all these yani, very, very expensive today? Very expensive. This is why we keep telling you, if you could afford hajj and you're young, do it. I know people that have performed hajj for $3,000 years ago. Three. Today, many of you are paying 20K. You see the difference? The same groups that were with me in 2019, the last time we had hajj that we could go to from outside Saudi Arabia, that package, they paid twelve to $15,000. Twelve, I think it was four in a room, and two in a room was $15,000. Today, the same package is seventeen and a half to $20,000. So if you can afford to do hajj, don't wait. You're going to pay more. <laughs> and you're probably going to get older, and you become more tired. The Prophet ﷺ said, النَّفَقَةُ فِي الْحَجِّ كَالنَّفَقَةِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الدِّرْهَمُ بِسَبْعِ مِئَةِ ضِعْفِ This should help you ease with that page, that check you, cut you wrote. It's, the Prophet ﷺ says, Spenditure in Hajj is like spending in the path and way of Allah. One dirham equates to 700 in rewards. So when you spend a thousand dollars, how much is that in your account? How many? Inshallah is a businessman, inshallah. 700,000. 1,000, Allah puts in your account that you spent how much? In the way of Allah. 700,000. Multiply that by the 20K that you're paying most of you. Inshallah, 700,000 times 20K. Almost $20 million. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in blessings and rewards. Ameen, Allahumma ameen. The Prophet ﷺ said, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ كَتَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْحَجَّ فَحُجُّ O people, Allah ordained hajj upon you. Perform hajj. And the hadith is long. And uh, we'll skip to another hadith. He said, مَنْ أَرَادَ الْحَجِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَلْيُعَجِّلْ فَإِنَّهُ قَدْ يَمْرَضُ الْمَرِيضُ وَتَضِلُّ الْرَاحِلَةِ وَتَكُونُ الْحَاجَةِ and another hadith, تَعَجَّلُ الْحَجَّ فَإِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ لَا يَدْرِي مَا يَعْرِضُ لَهُ Prophet said, if you intend on doing hajj, hurry up and do it. Get it done. He said, you don't know, one may become sick. And we see this. People younger than us, people our age, our colleagues, suddenly they become sick and fright. خلاص, they can't go anymore. And he said, at times, you may have a financial need that arises suddenly. And another hadith says, you don't know what may come up. So if you can, you're young, you have the financial and physical means, go. Don't waste time. And I explained a bunch of reasons. And the Prophet ﷺ's advice is above all. طيب. Who is to perform hajj? Who, who is, is, is it obligatory upon? A Muslim? that is of age, meaning age of puberty, and is sane, and is healthy, and they can financially afford to go to Hajj. طيب. How about if you, are, if you have a young child 
or you performed Hajj when you were before the age of puberty. The Prophet ﷺ in Hajjatul Wada', a lady took, raised her infant and she said, O oh Messenger of Allah, Ali Hadha Hajj? Faqala Naam wa Laki Ajr. Prophet ﷺ was asked, for, is, is there any Hajj for this, this one? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Yes, and for you, will, you will get the rewards. So these, the scholars explain that Hajj of, a, of an underage child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put in their account rewards of hajj and so will he generously put in their parents but it doesn't suffice for the obligatory hajj. They must perform hajj once they're of age and they can afford to do so. If a person lived and died and they could afford Hajj, but they didn't go for whatever reasons. Their heir or heirs should perform Hajj on their behalf. Should perform Hajj on their behalf, whether they do it themselves once they've performed their own, or they can hire someone and pay for them to do Hajj on their behalf. The condition for performing Hajj on behalf of anybody else is that you must have performed Hajj once for yourself prior to performing it for anybody else. Should you borrow money to perform Hajj? The answer is no. Can you pay Zakah money for someone else to perform Hajj? The answer is no. طيب. Can you buy things when you are in Hajj? Yes, of course. And maybe you should whether you go to Hajj or Umrah, so you can give your family gifts and that brings happiness to them and also encourage others to um, also uh, be excited about coming to such blessed places. طيب. Most of you are going to al Madina first, correct? Anybody here going to Mecca first to perform Hajj this year? طيب. So we will, inshallah, going to Medina is not part of Hajj, just to clarify. Going to Medina is not part of Hajj. But of course, if you are so close to the Prophet وسلم, you should go visit him. So going to Medina is for two or three main reasons. One is to pray in the Prophet وسلم's masjid. Because he said three masajid you should or uh, go to and visit. Masjid al-Haram, which is the Kaaba, the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, and the Masjid al-Aqsa, may Allah give it liberty and freedom. Ameen, Allahumma ameen. And its people. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi encouraged us to go to it. One prayer in the Prophet's Masjid is greater than 1,000 prayers elsewhere. Praying in the Prophet's Masjid, one Fajr is greater in reward than 1,000 Fajrs. One Dhuhr greater than 1,000 Dhuhrs. It's amazing. In Mecca, one greater than 100,000 prayers. It's a big deal. A big deal. A lot of rewards. A lot of chiching for those who don't know who know what that means. طيب. When you go to the Prophet's city, you're going to pray in his masjid, you're going to visit Rasulullah. And if you I suggest you go with an Imam in your group. And hopefully the Imam will, inshallah, cover the ziyarah and the details of ziyarah. For the sake of time, I won't go over a lot of the details of that. But visiting the Prophet ﷺ has etiquette. You should keep your voice down. You should be respectful. You should be cognizant of people around you. And be patient, inshallah, when you go there. Because sometimes some of the folks that are managing traffic may be impatient or disrespectful at times. So you don't want to lose your cool too, um, too easily. So... You're going to Medina to visit, to pray in the Prophet's masjid, to visit the Prophet. What else are you going to do? You're going to visit the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in Al Baqi'ah and in Uhud. And uh, if you can't get into Al Baqi'ah, at least from around it, from outside, so you go say salam to them. Over 10,000 Sahaba and Sahabiyat, including the family of the Prophet. And great, some of the greatest scholars to ever live, like Al Imam Malik. Uh, عنهم, أجمعين, are buried in Al Baqi'ah, which is the cemetery adjacent to the Prophet's masjid. 
طيب when you go to al Madina, you'll spend a few days there and there you're supposed to relax get some rest shop most of your shopping I would suggest it's about 25% cheaper than Mecca and uh, one of my, my Umrah buddies said more than that Mashallah, like I said, he's a businessman, you know, he knew how to shop. So, um, and uh, he, was not, he was with me in November, so he's got more you know, information. So if you go hang out with him, he'll tell you where the stores that he found good stuff. Mashallah, and Sister Ni'ma as well, his wife. Um, and you're supposed to pray in the Prophet's message. Try to pray all five prayers if you can. Try to drink a lot of zamzam. Try to relax. Visit the Prophet ﷺ. Visit the Baqiya. Make wudu one day and go pray in Masjid Quba and come back. You'll get reward of entire Umrah. By the way, people don't know that if you pray in any masjid, including Westchester, Fajr, and you stay in the house of Allah till 15 minutes after sunrise, and you're remembering Allah, whether you're reading Quran or istighfar or any remembrance of Allah, and you pray two rak'at after 15 minutes of, after sunrise, Allah will give you not only Umrah, Allah will give you Umrah and Hajj rewards, complete Hajj and complete Umrah. That's 20K plus. You just saved and you just got so many rewards. I really, we need to revive these, these in, you know, in our minds and hearts because it'll encourage us. When we know the virtue, we're motivated. So remember that. So anyhow, in Medina you spend a few days and then make sure you read your itinerary. A lot of people get the paper, they throw it away, and they start yani, uh, going about their business. Don't do that. Read the itinerary. Stay connected with your imam. Ask questions. And um, you will be prepared to go to Mecca. When you're going to Mecca, there are three types of intentions. For the hujjaj, three types of intentions. The first one is mufrid. You don't need to remember these words. You just need to know what they mean. The second one is uh, muqrin. And the third one is mutamatta. What does this mean? Someone with the intention of going to Mecca to only perform hajj. No umrah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they would make ihram. They're going to perform hajj. So they wear their ihram and they stay in ihram till they finish hajj. And they did not perform any umrah. The second is muqrin. They make intention to perform umrah and hajj, but with the same ihram. Meaning, and I will explain what ihram means. Ihram means intention and state of restriction. So, they make the intention of ihram. لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِعُمْرَةٍ And uh, he says, or he says, بِعُمْرَةٍ uh, فتقبلها مني أو بحج فتقبله مني أو بعمرة متمتع بها إلى الحج فتقبله مني أو تقبلهما مني depending on what intention they're doing they say لبيك اللهم لبيك and they stay in that state of إحرام if they are مقرن till they're done with the تحلل after Eid and I'll explain that the third kind which I would highly recommend for you. I wouldn't recommend the first nor the second, even both are permissible. I would recommend the third. And the only time I would recommend the second is for a lady that starts to menstruate then and there uh, in Medina. And then I would suggest she would make the intention of Quran and stay in that state. That way she gets the rewards of Umrah and Hajj without having to do much tawaf or much sa'i. Half of the Sa'i and tawaf, and we can explain that on a more individual basis. And if you go with your imam, he'll explain that to you. But the one I recommend is called tamattu. What does that mean? You make intention to perform umrah. Once you finish the umrah, you get out of the state of ihram. You live normally. You wear regular clothes, shower with scented soaps. And then the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah, you put on your ihram and you make the intention for hajj and you go and finish your hajj. So you get to do umrah and hajj in the same trip, but separately, separate ihrams. Do we understand? That's called mutamatta. And I would recommend that. That's the one you're gonna do. Umrah, you make, you, you put, 
yourself in the state of ihram and you go to Mecca, finish your umrah, get out of ihram, just like you did in November. And then you get back in ihram for hajj and you finish your hajj and get out of ihram. And this is called umrat labbayka Allahumma bi umratin mutamatti'in biha ila al-hajj fataqabbalha minni. You say, oh Allah, I come to you to perform Umrah and I will do tamattu' meaning I will get out of the state of Ihram once I finish Umrah and then I will go and get back in Ihram for Hajj. Oh Allah, accept both from me. Okay, that's the, that's the one I would recommend. It's the easiest and that's uh, what I would recommend. And also some scholars, there's a difference of opinion on saying which one is more rewards, but many have said this one has the most reward because you do more action. This one you do more tawaf, you do more sa'i, and therefore you get more reward according to some scholars. Tayyib, what do we do? Umrah has four pillars. How many pillars for Umrah? How many pillars? You have to wake up. How many? Four. How many for Hajj? I will tell you in a minute or a few minutes. Umrah has four pillars. Pay attention. Because that's four-fifths of, almost four-fifths of the pillars of Hajj. The first one is called Ihram. What is the first pillar? What is it called? Ihram. What is Ihram? I promise if you pay attention, you'll be an Umrah expert. I promise. Umrah is, in t- I mean, Ihram is intention. What, what does that mean? You say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ I am about to perform Umrah, accept it from me. From that moment onwards, you are in a state of restriction, of ihram. Saying this intention and making it starts the first pillar of Umrah. Clear? Now this ihram has some sunnas. What is the pillar itself? Intention. What is it? You make intention. You started your Mansak, you started your Umrah or you started your Hajj with this Ihram. Just like you say Takbiratul Ihram, Allahu Akbar, you started your prayer, right? That is the initiation of your ritual. The initiation of Umrah or Hajj is with Ihram. What is Ihram? I need to hear a clear answer. Intention. So you say verbally, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِعُمْرَةٍ فتقبلها مني or لبيك اللهم بعمرة متمتع بها إلى الحج فتقبلها مني فإن حبسني حابس فمحلي حيث حبستني this if I was if I am your imam may Allah make it happen then I will guide you word by word I grab the microphone I make sure that my bus says this and I explain all of that to you there and before we go and on the bus I will make sure you know exactly what you're doing for you to know today Umrah has four pillars, one of which is what? Ihram. And Ihram means what? Intention. Ihram has some sunnas, some highly recommended prophetic rituals. What are they? Number one, you should make wudu or bathe. So take, take a shower with scented soap. You should trim, clip your nails. You should um, get rid of armpit hair and uh, pubic hairs. You should uh, brush your teeth. You should smell good. And for the ladies, smell good just for yourself, not to be too yani, much. This should, before you make the intention of ihram. For the ladies, you wear regular clothes that is accepted, accepted by Islamic teachings and guidelines with the exception of not covering. You must not cover the face and the hands. Face and hands. These two don't cover. Other than that, wear uh, regular clothing. For the men, you have two sheets that you wear. The ihram, uh, what I would call uniform. And that has two pieces, one around the waist and one over the shoulders. And that's it. Unless you have a particular illness, you can speak to the imam on privately and they will explain to you what you need to do. But if you're healthy, those two only, and you must not wear anything on your head. Unless, again, you have a health condition, you can talk to your imam. 
Um, can, what can you wear? You can wear a ring. You can wear jewelry. You can wear a belt. You can wear... Uh, you can have a purse. These you can, you can have. You can wear a face mask for like the ones you're wearing for health. These are permissible. For men, you cannot wear regular shoes. It has to be open from the back. Kind of like Crocs or any type of chappal or shibshib or those kinds of uh, shoes during the state of ihram. If you don't have, then you must ruin your shoes and step on them or go buy some 10 riyal type of shoes, but I would recommend you buy your shoes from here. And the shoe I would recommend, especially for the brothers, sisters, it's optional because you can wear any comfortable shoes you have. But for brothers, they can't wear socks and they can't wear regular shoes. So I would highly recommend a brand called Ufos. O-O-F-O-S. O-O-F-O-S. You shop for it, it's about 50 to $60 a pair of slippers. Get the one that has the, the the, the, the thong in the middle, that way um, you can actually uh, walk with it long distance. The one that doesn't, it would, it's not as comfortable. So, and I have an example of one here, that way this will, inshallah ta'ala, help you and when you walk for so many miles in it, this is what I would recommend. It costs about 60 bucks, but it's one of the best investments for your umrah or hajj and you will really appreciate it. It's made for walking long distance, it's waterproof, and I would highly recommend it. Be careful when you're walking on marble that's wet, you will slip. So you need to make sure, be careful with that, whether you're wearing this slipper or any other slipper. طيب. Once you take a shower, you make yourself groomed, you put on some itr or cologne, um, you wear your two sheets, and let me explain for the brothers. May I have a volunteer? MashaAllah. This is the bottom part. It's called Izar. You don't have to memorize that. And you would have a similar one that's called Rida that goes on your shoulders. As he's trying to wear it like this, Brothers, be careful, and sisters, if you have children or you really care about your husbands, pay attention because you want to warn them not to do what he just did. If you wore it like this, you can really get hurt. How so? Open your legs as if you're running or walking. No, no, keep it. Spread your leg forward. No, no, your one leg forward as far as you can. If you notice, because the circumference of the bottom is so tight, if he runs, and you will run at the green light, the bottom, the back, will pull your other leg and you will fall on your back and really hurt yourself. So how do you avoid that? So if you have children, you're helping them dress, your husband, and you really care about him, because if you don't say anything, then we know what you want. It's a bad intention for Hajj, wrong place. So what I would suggest is you spread your legs really wide, as wide as you can, more, very good. Now do what you did. Very simple. You'll find many other ways, but this is the easiest, and that's what I would suggest for now. Perfect. Now if he spreads his legs, mashallah, as wide as he did, so he, can, he won't be falling. This is important for the brothers. Jazakallah khairan. The top, put it all around. Perfect. This is the default. No, 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 don't do that. This. this is the default that's how you should wear your ihram most of the time the only time you will do something called ittiba' let me show you what that is go ahead do the right shoulder this is called ittiba' what is ittiba' the right shoulder is shown and you can use some strong pins, don't buy the cheap pins. Go and find those big elephant pins. Those usually work. The other ones, they'll hurt you. They'll open up and... So this, you do only one time. When do you do this? Only the first tawaf you enter Mecca on your entire trip. Let me say this again. The time you show your right shoulder 
is only for your first tawaf around the Kaaba, the first seven times around the Kaaba, the first time on your first trip. So this means how many times during your Hajj trip are you going to wear it like this? One time. What if you did five Umrahs? How many times are you going to do this? One time. The next trip, when you come back to the States or wherever you go back to, and then you go again, you can do that again on your first entrance to the first tawaf. Do we understand? As soon as you're done with the seven, before you pray your two rak'at, what do you do? What do you do? You cover the shoulders. You pray with your shoulder covered. So do we understand how long the period should be for showing the right shoulder? And do we understand when it should be done? This is a sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Okay? There's another sunnah. It's called uh, Ramal. And I will explain what that is. It's basically fake jogging. Light jogging. You do that the first three times around the Kaaba. Only if you can. If you go there and it's jam-packed, don't you do that. Okay? Why do we show the right shoulder? And why do we do yani, this march type Yani uh, jog, you can take that off if you like. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you for volunteering, I appreciate it. Jazakallah khairan, I'll take it, that's okay. So, why do we do that? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, when he went to perform uh, hajj or umrah, I can't remember, either way he went to do tawaf in ihram, the, pe- the kuffar of Quraysh, they... Uh, no, it must have been Umrah. It was Umrah. The kuffar of Quraysh, they said, oh, Medina has this um, flu that's going on. And the, they, rum- they spread a rumor that the Muslims are severely sick and they're going to all die off pretty soon from this contagious flu. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he got wind of that, he wanted to send a message that we're strong and we're not sick and we ain't going anywhere. So the Prophet ﷺ told them to make a tiba, to show their shoulder and muscles, start working out. You know, no saggy arms. And, <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ, he told them to march, the first three. Do we understand that the hikmah behind it? Okay. Now, what is ihram again? What is ihram? Intention. All that I just said, is sunnah of ihram. Everything I just mentioned right now is what? Sunnah of ihram. Most of what I just said. Which means, if I didn't shower, and didn't make wudu, and didn't uh, get rid of unwanted hairs, didn't trim my mustache, and didn't pray the two rak'at, and made the intention, is my ihram correct? The answer is yes. Because what is ihram? Intention. Did I fulfill my intention? Yes. Even if I didn't wear this and made the intention, is my intention fulfilled? Yes. But you have penalties. And your imam will cover those penalties as they accumulate if you're not paying attention and you're making mistakes or if you're intentionally not doing particular things because of special circumstances. Someone has a particular health uh, condition or anything like that, we can handle that on a one-on-one basis. We'll explain to you what is due uh, for you to, to pay and you can do that. But it is sunnah to bathe or make wudu, to pray two rak'at, when you go to the miqat or before it, and this is called sunnatul ihram. And I have to clarify just for a moment, before you get into ihram, when you wear this, and you, uh, if you're, again, hajj is a special season, so a lot of things may need to be adjusted on your way. And your leader or imam will tell you what you need to do. So you don't necessarily always get a chance to go to Dhul Hulayfa. You have to go to a Miqat. What is a Miqat? A station, if you're going from Medina to Mecca to perform Umrah or Hajj, at that point or earlier, at that point or before it, you must be in state of Ihram. Do we understand? 
it is sunnah of Rasulullah to make wudu, put on your ihram, and the lady can just wear the regular clothes they have, and you go to this miqat, which is in your case called Dhul Hulayfa, also known as Abyar Ali. It's Dhul Hulayfa. And you go there, you pray two rak'at, sunnah to ihram, you, make, you get on your ride, the sunnah is to actually get on your bus or whatever you're riding, and as soon as the wheel turns, don't wait much because a few meters in your past. And if you do that, if you wait till it passes, you must pay penalty, sacrifice a sheep, 200 bucks at least. So mistakes will be costly, pay attention. So as soon as the wheel turns, you say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِعُمْرَةٍ مُتَمَتِّعٍ بِهَا إِلَى الْحَجِّ فَتَقَبَّلْهَا مِنِّي فَإِنْ حَبَسَنِي حَابِسٌ فَمَحِلِّي حَيْثُ حَبَسْتَنِي That's ideally speaking. What may happen, sometimes there's no buses to take you to Dhul Hulayfa because you're taking the train. The buses that are coming are not going to take you to Dhul Hulayfa, then pick you up from Dhul Hulayfa to the train station. What they will do is probably take you from the, your hotel straight to the train station. So, are you going to go to the Miqat? No. When should you pray your two rak'at? In the Prophet's Masjid, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or in the hotel before you actually get on the bus to go to the train station? Do we understand how to react? Of course, your group leader should be able to guide you, but listening to this should also help prepare you. Okay? Once you get on the train, it's still beyond, before the miqat, so as soon as it starts moving, your group leader should tell you to say the intention. And you make the intention before you pass the miqat. If you pass the miqat before the intention, you have one of two solutions. Either you go back behind the miqat, make the intention and come back, no penalty, or you can't go back and therefore, which is the likelihood of what's happening, once you pass it, you can't go back. What's going to happen is you pay penalty. Sacrifice one lamb for each person. Costs a lot of money. So start paying attention. If your imam is with you, inshallah, I will tell you what to say and when. But say you get on the, on the train, mashallah, they tell you this is full, this is full, this is full. You end up being tossed all the way to, you know, a faraway car or cart. Then you know what to say. You make intention, it doesn't matter in any language. Oh Allah, I'm ready to make umrah with the intention of going to hajj and making tamattu' between them. Oh Allah, accept from me. Labbayk Allahumma labbayk. You're experts, you should have no problem. Okay. What are some restrictions of this first, of this ihram, the state of restriction? Number one, no scented perfumes or colognes. No scented shampoos. No scented products. The only time you can use scented is if you go and there's hand soap, and that's the only hand soap that's available in the bathroom. After using the bathroom, you are permissible, it is permissible for you to wash your hands with that soap after using the restroom and moving on. But to shower with scented soap, to use scented deodorant after ihram, to put on perfume, no, you cannot do that in the state of ihram. Okay? Another restriction, you cannot cut, intentionally cut or get rid of any hair. So no cutting of your hair, oh now I'm in ihram, I use the mirror and start playing with my mustache, you can't do that. You cannot clip your nails. Uh, you cannot wear regular clothing for the men, for the ladies don't cover your face and hands, and uh, these, and you cannot cover your head as a man, and don't wear regular shoes. So these are some of the restrictions of ihram. What else? Two other restrictions. No uh, flirting with your wife, that is, of course. So when you're in a state of ihram, your wife is like your sister, and your husband's like your brother for the time of ihram. Do we understand? You can talk to each other, you can sit next to each other, you can sleep in the same room, but you have to treat each other like siblings. Alright? No intimacy in any shape or form, including verbal, including texting, including anything. No intimacy, seriously. You have to be told. So, once you're in the state of ihram, you and your husband, great, but you, cannot, you can't treat each other with any type of foreplay or any type of sexual... Um, behavior. طيب, what the other restriction is that you cannot propose to anyone 
on your behalf or on behalf of anyone else. Let me say that again. You cannot propose to someone, so don't say, I'd like to marry you or I'd like to marry you. You can't do that. And you can't say, oh, I have a, a very handsome son and you have a beautiful daughter that's with us. I would like her to marry him. Cannot do that. So all that needs to be put on hold till you're done with your ihram. Clear? Do we understand the first pillar? Do we understand the first pillar? Clear? Second pillar. You go to Mecca. They put your bags in your hotel. You go to your room. You use the restroom. You make wudu. You may take a shower if you choose to, but you cannot use scented soaps. That's it. You can shower regular water. You can use unscented soap or shampoo. No problem. You can use unscented deodorant. No problem. You can just water, put water on your body and freshen up. No problem. You can use a towel, dry yourself. And if any accidental hair comes out from itching or from a towel drying you, that's okay. From combing your hair, that's okay. And then you make wudu and you, your men put back your ihram on. Or you can have multiple ihram uniforms. So if one, you can have two, one is sweaty or gets dirty, you can put on a new one. That's no problem. The ladies wear whatever clothes they want. And then you head down from your hotel with your group leader, hopefully, and go where? To perform the second pillar. What is the second pillar? Tawaf. What is it called? Louder. What? MashaAllah, what kind of hujjaj are you? Tawaf. What is it called? You know the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of hajj is the one that people use their voices so loudly in it to a point where it goes away. Most of the Sahaba, their voices will go away. That's for men. For ladies, you still say talbiya. But you and just those around you could hear you. So even talbiya should be said verbally, loud enough. So if you're saying, oh, uh, this is not going to work. It's not the hajj spirit. Okay? Hajj is, hajj is jihad, man. Hajj is, you know, you're, you're really going to push your physical body to some, some limits. Inshallah, we're very spoiled today. But regardless of what how spoiled you are, you're still going to go through some, some challenges. Um, but anyhow, the second pillar of Umrah is what? Tawaf. Tawaf is walking around the Kaaba seven times. How many times? Seven times. Tawaf requires state of purity, meaning you must have wudu. Tawaf, you must have wudu for tawaf. So when you go to your hotel, what do you need to do? Wudu. Don't you come down from your hotel and say, Imam, I need to go make wudu. You should do that before you come down. Tayyib. You make talbiyah the entire time, from the time you make your ihram intention at or before the miqat, in your case, Medina, the Hulayfa, 500 kilometers north of Mecca, all the way, going up the hotel, down the hotel, on the bus, on the train, on all of that, walking, sitting, standing until your eyes see the Kaaba. Once your eyes see the Kaaba, no more labbaik Allahumma labbaik. And by the way, just for practice, what is the talbiyah? Say it with me. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik labbaik la sharika laka labbaik inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak that's one talbiyah, and you keep saying that. One more practice. I saw about 50% yani participation. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك لبيك اللهم لبيك That's how it continues. Do we understand? What does this mean? لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ When someone calls you, in this case Allah Jalla wa Ala Almighty, when He calls us and invites us to come, the best and most respectful response you can ever have in the Arabic language is لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ Absolutely, O oh Allah, I am coming. And you can use لَبَّيْكَ in response to someone else, it doesn't have to be just only to Allah Jalla wa'ala. 
I, I, let me teach you uh, or share with you the humility, a lesson in humility. My teacher, Sheikh Dr. Fadilat Sheikh Salah Sawi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him shifa, give him long, righteous, prosperous life. Amin, Allahumma amin. And increase him in knowledge and blessings. He's considered perhaps the most knowledgeable scholar in the Western Hemisphere by testimony of most scholars and imams in America and Canada. He memorized the entire Holy Quran and got first place in the International Quran Competition in Egypt when he was seven years old. Valedictorian of his class every year. One of the people that will realize his magnitude a few hundred years after he passes away. A once in a lifetime knowledgeable faqih and scholar. When I tell you this, I pick up the phone to call him I'm a teeny tiny student compared to him. I call him and I say, Dear Uncle Dr. Salah, because I've known him since I was a little child, I have a quick question for you. You know what he says to me? Labbaik. He says to me, Labbaik. This is a man, the age of my father exponentially more knowledgeable than I can ever be. And he responds to his student saying, Labbaik. So again, back to the Talbiya. We continue to say Talbiya. Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. Oh Allah, here I am responding to your call. Because Allah is the one that said, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ And perform and completion, or complete the performance of Hajj and Umrah for Allah. Why are you going? Why are we going? Maybe I should have covered that first. Why are we going? To gain the pleasure of Allah. Only, solely, that's it. Why are we going? To gain the pleasure of Allah. Why? Allah said, perform hajj, I am responding. And Allah sent you an invitation, you're responding. Allah accepted you, you're responding. Now, you say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ There's no one I associate with you. There is none to be associated with you to begin with. لَبَّيْكَ You're affirming and repeating. إِنَّ الْحَمْدَ All praise, وَالنِّعْمَةَ And all blessings, لَكَ وَالْمُلْكَ Are from you, and they belong to you, and all the dominion belongs to you. لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ There is no partner to you. This is... The talbiyah. You continue to do that until your eyes gaze at the Kaaba. Once you see that, then you make a special dua. The first one is you say, Allahumma zid hadha al bayta tashrifan wa takriman wa ta'ziman wa mahabatan wa birra wa zid man sharrafahu mimman hajjahu aw i'tamarahu tashrifan wa takriman wa mahabatan wa birra. If you don't know all of that, you can memorize it from now till then. And I would strongly recommend you start increasing your du'a memorization. But the gist of it is, Oh Allah, increase this house in more blessings and more respect and more dignity. And increase everyone who has come here to visit it. Whether they're performing Umrah or Hajj, in dignity, prosperity, blessings and respect. And then you make any du'a. By the way, any du'a now on your journey during your journey, anywhere in your journey, including that moment, inshallah is accepted. So this is one of those special moments that you actually um, should make special dua after that until you get close to the Kaaba. Once you get close to the Kaaba, you need to start from where? The black stone. Where do you count your tawaf from? The black stone. You may not necessarily get to the Kaaba, Sahn al Kaaba, the entrance of the area of Tawaf, main floor, right away. You may enter from this side, you may enter from this side. You never know which exit will be open or entrance. So, therefore, if you enter and the black stone is way far, you keep walking with the group until you get to the black stone area. So, don't be rigid. I see people sometimes go against the current, against the, the, the and they go around against it and they want to get to the, you know, so it's over here instead of me going around an entire turn, I'm going to go this way. Don't do that. 
You're going to harm a lot of people, get in people's way. Just walk around a little bit extra. We all can use the walk. Once you get to the black stone, you don't have to touch it, but that area, then it is sunnah to kiss it. If you cannot kiss it, it's sunnah to touch it. If you cannot touch it, it's sunnah to reach it with a stick. If you cannot reach it with a stick, it's sunnah to just raise your hand or hands towards the black stone. Do we understand? The likelihood of you kissing it as you get there is almost impossible. So what you want to do is you go, Bismillahi, Wallahu Akbar. I explain this to you because there was a time in my lifetime where when you go, you can kiss the black stone at almost every turn when I was younger. So, and it was an off season and you can do that. Now, mashallah, with the numbers, it's impossible. So, you raise your hand, you say, Bismillahi, Wallahu Akbar. That begins your tawaf. And you make dua, learn the dua, Allahumma imanan bika, wa tasdiqan bi kitabika, wa wafaan bi ahdika, wa tiba'an li sunnati nabiyika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the beginning of the dua of walking around the Kaaba. Once you raise your hand and say, Bismillahi wallahu akbar. Memorize that. If you're with me, I will say this loudly. You will hear me. You will repeat after me. We will be saying it together. So, but you should still do your homework so you're prepared. Okay? You're not lip syncing. I know who's lip syncing in the group. You do that after you make this dua, make any dua in dhikr of Allah Jalla wa'ala. All the dua you need. This is special for you. But here's my recommendation make sure your dua has two components dua for dunya and dua for akhirah. Don't just make dua, oh Allah, give me a good car, give me a Tesla, give me a Lamborghini, give me a Bentley, Allah, give me a private jet, oh Allah, give me a 55,000 acre and 55,000 square foot home, oh Allah, give me, you know, mashallah, it's good, make that dua, but don't stop there. Say, make sure you have, oh Allah, give me Jannah, oh Allah, make my grave a garden of paradise, oh Allah, increase me in knowledge that is beneficial, oh Allah, have me with, be with the, in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, increase me in deen and ikhlas. Make dua for akhirah too. Okay? Oh Allah, pardon me from hell, hellfire. It's, it's masnoon dua, and I'll explain to you even around tawaf to say that. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَهُ وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَهُ وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ آمين اللهم آمين. But um, make dua for dunya and akhirah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the ayat of Hajj, فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا كَسَبُوا وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ الْحِسَابِ The kuffar of Quraysh or the kuffar even outside Quraysh used to only ask for dunya. Oh Allah, give us prosperous life and year and healthy children and beautiful wife and blah, 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 blah. And they would never ask for akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about them and he said these people will get nothing for akhirah. But then there are others, that will, the believers that is, that will say, oh Allah, give us the best of this world, the best of the hereafter, pardon all of us from the punishment of the hellfire. And Allah praise such people that make that dua. When you're going around the Kaaba, make dua for dunya and akhirah. Another recommendation I would recommend, make dua for yourself, your spouse, your children, your parents, your loved ones, your relatives, your friends, your community, your masjid here, and last, and your ummah, the Muslim ummah. Believe me, your dua will help them, will help us as an ummah. And then lastly but not least, if you can remember this poor soul, I would really appreciate you remember me in your dua. You go around the Kaaba. The Yemeni corner is the corner right before the black stone. The black stone is the one right before the door, right adjacent to the door of the Kaaba. The corner right bef next to it, two corners. Yemeni corner, black stone. Yemeni corner, it's sunnah to touch it. That's it. Don't rub your clothes on it. Don't rub your face on it. Don't kiss it. It's almost impossible to do any of that. Sometimes you may be able to touch it if it's not too many people. But that's all this, that you should do. Once you cross it and you're going towards, you have a very little space, one side of the Kaaba only. It's sunnah to say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Say with me. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Wa qina athab al nar. Wa adhilna al jannata ma al abrar. Bi rahmatika ya azizu ya ghaffar. Okay? This is from the Yemeni corner to where? 
the black stone. Then you get to the black stone, what do you do? Raise your hand. What do you say? Bismillahi, wallahu akbar. That's called one shout, one round. How many do you need to do? Seven. What should you be busy doing? Dua, istighfar, salah on the Prophet وسلم, Quran recitation, anything, dhikr of Allah, anything, remembrance of Allah. Can you do it in English, Urdu, Arabi, Chinese, Fulani, any language? Try to memorize some of the Sunnah dua, but when you make other dua, you don't have to restrict yourself to one particular language. Make from your heart. Seven times. Once you're done with seven times, what do you do? You walk where the door of the Kaaba is, there's Maqam Ibrahim. You walk a little further back where it's safe enough distance, you're not in people's way and path, and you make two rak'at. Two rak'at. This is called Sunnah to Tawaf. And it is Sunnah to recite Fatiha in the first one, and then Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, and then the second rak'at Fatiha, and then Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. Very light, two simple rak'at. You finish them, take a group picture with the Kaaba behind you. <laughs> Seriously, you should. It is not part of the fiqh of, of, of tawaf, but it is memorable. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the righteous. You take a picture, and um, that's not part of umrah, but that's something I would recommend. <laughs> and then after that, you go towards the, towards the Mas'a. On your way to the Mas'a, you drink Zamzam. That's the time that we should drink Zamzam. How do you drink Zamzam? Fill your cups, say Bismillah, and the brothers and sisters should give each other. Don't just go and hog the, the, the Zamzam uh, you know, container. No, fill and give them, fill and give them, fill and give them, fill and give them. The spirit of this whole trip is to serve. The spirit of this entire trip is to serve, not be served. If you have that attitude, your trip is going to be the best. If you have any other attitude, your trip is going to be miserable. I'm going to say this again. Every time we go, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me with every, almost every time I've gone, my group is the happiest group in, out of 4,000 people that go in that one trip. Why are they the happiest? And I see some of them here. Because our attitude, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the beginning, I tell you, have the attitude of serving each other. If you have that attitude, your trip is going to be phenomenal. Inshallah. If you have an any other attitude, your trip is not going to be phenomenal, to say the least. So when you're there, fill zamzam, give others. Fill zamzam, give others. You go to get something. Hey, would you like some water? Would you like some this? And you this spirit, subhanAllah, it's going to be an amazing trip. You drink Zamzam, you face the Kaaba while you're drinking Zamzam, you say Bismillah, and you make dua. The Prophet ﷺ explains Zamzam lima shuriba lah. And it's ta'am wa tu'min wa shifa'u suqmin, or saqamin. The Prophet ﷺ said, it will fill you, it will cure you, make dua, and Allah will accept your dua when you drink Zamzam. So you really make a wish, that's where you make wishes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have children, tell them to do the same. Wash your face with some zamzam. Just be careful. Don't make a puddle. Go to a, over a garbage can or something, and you can do that. And the water goes in the big garbage cans. So that way you don't wet the place and people slip. But put some water on your head. Put some water on your face. Drink some water. Drink more. Drink more. The, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he said, one of the distinguishing factors between hypocrites and true believers, we found, is that true believers would drink to their fill zamzam, and hypocrites would drink just a few sips and walk away. So drink zamzam. After you're done drinking zamzam, we're done with the second pillar. How many pillars are we done with? What's the first one? What is it called? Ihram. What is ihram? Intention. Now you're experts. What is the terminology? What's the first pillar? Ihram. What is it? What is ihram? After, when you do the second pillar, what is the second pillar? Tawaf. How many times around the Kaaba? You have to have wudu? 
What if you broke your wudu? You've gone around, say, three times. You finished three times, Bismillahul Akbar, three full times. And you broke your wudu on your fourth. Or you had an emergency. You needed to sit down, or someone needed to get some medicine for emergency, or someone you needed to tend to on their emergency, or you needed to change your child's diaper, or you had to, uh, you were hyperglycemic, hypoglycemic and you needed to eat something. After the three that you finished, and you need to make wudu or use the bathroom, you go, do that, and as soon as you're done, no going you know, for naps and watching TV, no, 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 right away. You make wudu, use the restroom, make wudu, you come back, and you have to start that fourth one again. So if the ones you completed, counted. The one you did half of it, doesn't count. You got to start that one again. Clear? We finished drinking zamzam, where do we head to? Sa'i. Sa'i meaning walking quickly between Safa and Marwa. Where do we start with? Inna Safa wal Marwata min sha'airi Allah. فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا وَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Memorize this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. That's what you should say when you're climbing up the Safa. You go up the Safa, you stand on the mountain, you face the Kaaba, and you say the dua that you were too lazy to remember, no offense, the dua of the, the, the uh, Eid. Takbirat. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illa Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Walillahi alhamd. Allahu Akbar kabira. Walhamdulillahi kathira. Wa subhanallahi bukratan wa asila. La ilaha illa Allah wahdah صدق وعده ونصر عبده وأعز جنده وهزم الأحزاب وحده لا إله إلا الله ولا نعبد إلا إياه مخلصين له الدين ولو كره الكافرون اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وعلى أصحاب سيدنا محمد وعلى أنصار سيدنا محمد وعلى أزواج سيدنا محمد وعلى ذرية سيدنا محمد وسلم تسليما كثيرا and then you start climbing down. Inna al-Safa wal Marwata min Shaa'ir Allah. فمن حج البيت أو اعتمر فلا جناح عليه أن يطوف بهما ومن تطوع خيرا فإن الله شاكر عليم. You don't have to say all of that, but I like to at least the first time I climb up, face the Kaaba and say it. Put in your revive in your mind and heart, the, and imagine with me the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم standing on the Safa facing the Kaaba after. Over 360 idols were worshipped around the Kaaba. And the Kaaba no longer has any of those de these idols and shaitan. And now Rasulullah says, La ilaha illa Allah, wa la na'budu illa iyyah, mukhlisina lahu al-deen, wa law kariha al-kafirun. La ilaha illa Allah, wahda, sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa a'azza junda, wa hazam al-ahzab wahda. La ilaha illa Allah. Till the end. Do we understand what the context of the dua? You're looking at the Kaaba after its purification. And Rasulullah was forced out of Mecca. And now this is the place of Tawheed for the whole world. It's a big deal. You have to revive that in your heart. How does that relate to you and I? How does that relate to you and I? When you say, وَلَا نَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهِ the true ubudiyya to Allah, I only worship Allah. This means you are not going to ever worship your desire. You're not going to worship what is acceptable politically or, or not acceptable. You're not going to worship any fame 
or any worldly gains. The only one you worship is Allah and therefore you are absolutely a Muslim to Allah and a pure monotheist. This is, this should you take that with you as an attitude. You are a true servant of Allah only. What Allah says is halal is halal. What Allah says is haram is haram. I am absolutely the servant and slave of Allah. You do that from Safa, you go to Marwa. On your way to Marwa, just a few feet down, you will see this green light in the, in the top. You run. It's called Al Mas'a. You run. If you can, do it. If you can't, you can walk. It's okay. Just don't hurt anybody, don't push anybody. And for the sisters, <laughs> there's a long debate, but if there's no non-mahram that sees you, then you can run. But if non-mahrams can see you, the scholarly recommendation is that you don't run. Some sisters like to run. MashaAllah, if you're covered and nobody can see any uh, particular body parts of yours and their shapes, then you can perhaps, yani, if you choose to run with your husband, uh, I won't stop you. But... Um, I'll share with you a funny story. You want to hear a funny story? Every time we go to Hajj and Umrah, mashallah, we have a nice group. And one year, my father, you want to take a guess, mashallah, may Allah bless all of our parents. Say, I mean, take a guess how many Hajj did my dad perform? Take a guess. He says 30, 7, 1, 49. Alhamdulillah, may Allah accept. 49 Hajj. And most of them are from here, from the States. So he has experience. <laughs> and Michelle, he's a scholar. So one time he and I are giving this same lecture. And I am practicing in front of my father. So I was the group leader. My father is with me. I'm practicing in front of him. And I say this. And one of the ladies... She raises her hand and she's very angry, very angry, very angry, disrespectfully angry. She says, you men, you men stop us from running when Hajar is a female and she's the one that ran. And you men are trying to stop us from running. Of course, Hajar had no one around her except her baby Ismail, right? But again, we try to explain to her. We try to, my father is 49, Hajj experience tries to explain to her. She wasn't having it. This is an imposition by men. I'm not going to stop you if you run. <laughs> I'm just telling you what we learned. So we do ihram, we go to Mecca, we get in our hotel, get down, we go to see the Kaaba. As soon as we're walking towards the Kaaba, she says, Imam. I said, yes. She says, I need a wheelchair. <laughs> My response was just that. I only, I only smiled. <laughs> I, I didn't say anything else. We got the, yeah, you gave us such a hard time. <laughs> Anyhow, we do sa'i from Safa to Marwa, Marwa to Safa. You don't have to climb all the way up. As long as you just touch the base, you can turn around. Okay? Depending on how tired my group is, I make sure I navigate that way. So Safa to Marwa is one. Marwa to Safa is two. Safa to Marwa is three. Four. So we start at Safa. Where do you end after seven? Marwa. Do we understand? Do you have to have wudu and sa'i? The answer is no. It's recommended, but if it breaks, continue your sa'i. Don't go make wudu. Fair enough? This is the third pillar of Umrah. How many pillars have we completed? The first one is what? The second one? The third one? And the last pillar of Umrah is tahallul, cutting your hair. For men, it's recommended to shave. For or second is to trim, but you have to trim all of your hair. Even if you see other people do a small clip and they say we're done, that's not my recommendation. So that's on you and them. My recommendation, you clip from all of your hair, full haircut, or shave the whole thing. For the sisters, you grab your hair when you go to your hotel, you can do it for yourself, your husband can do it for you, your son, a mahram, or another sister. Whether they broke their ihram or didn't break their ihram is irrelevant. You grab your hair, put it all in one yani, fist, and then you go about maybe half an inch, one centimeter from the bottom. You cut that with a scissor, and you're done. 
Once you, do, you did that, you're done with ihram. You're done with umrah. You're free to shower with scented soaps, wear regular clothes, put on cologne, perfume, whatever it is. This is umrah. Of course, after you're done with sa'ah, you should make some dua on marwa. But besides, that's, that's umrah. If, when you're done with this, now you will stay in Mecca, going to pray and, and so forth. You can do multiple umrahs if you want. Go to Tan'im, make ihram there, come back, do a umrah, go back. You'll find the Saudi fatwa there is no, don't do except one umrah for hajj. That's because they live right next door to the Kaaba. You people live thousands of miles away and you pay 20K, which they're not paying. So when you go there, the time between your entry to Kaaba, the first umrah and hajj, the eighth day, you can perform as many umrahs as you like. Despite what the fatwa there says, with all due respect. Okay? And then, and if you shaved your head the first time, the barber will just run the blade on your head, and a little bit of hairs will come out, and that suffices. You will do that and worship Allah for, eight, for however many days until the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah. Until when? Eighth day of Dhul Hijjah. The eighth day of Dhul Hijjah is called Yawm al Tarwiyah. That day, you will do what you did in Medina when you're ready to go to Mecca to make Umrah. You will shower, you will clean yourself. By the way, doesn't mean for every Umrah you gotta shave or, and, and, and do all. No, 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 no. As, as long as you're clean, you did it once, khalas, you're fine. You don't have to, it's not for every ritual. You need to be clean for every ritual, but it doesn't mean you have to yani, shave your underarms and do all these other things every time. Okay? Only if need be. But shower, make yourself presentable, groom yourself, and you put on your ihram, and you make intention as you get on the bus in front of your hotel or behind it, and your bus starts to go to Mina, you make the intention for hajj. What do you say? لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِحَجٍّ فَتَقَبَّلْهُ مِنِّي فَإِنْ حَبَسَنِي حَابِسٌ فَمَحِلِّي حَيْثُ حَبَسْتَنِي And if you don't know any of that, you can say لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ I am about to perform hajj, Allah accept it from me. And if you don't know how to say any of that, your imam or group leader should be able to help you with that. Okay? We go to Mina. Mina is a desert area. Mountains, usually nothing is going on the whole year. Except during these few days of Hajj. And this is a reminder that, oh Allah, we will glorify you anywhere we go. In the mountainous areas, in the sandy areas, in the non-populated areas, we glorify you. And we go there, we stay the eighth day. The very next morning is the main pillar of Hajj. Hajj has how many pillars? Five. Four of which I just explained to you. There's one more. What is it called? Going to Arafah. And let me explain. There's a little bit of explanation. So the ninth day, we go to Arafah. We should stay there from Dhuhr to Maghrib. And alhamdulillah, all of our groups stay there all the way to Maghrib. And when we're in Arafah, we will pray Dhuhr and Asr, Jamma. But we will not pray Maghrib. And we will wait till Maghrib arrives, like, just like now. And then our groups will be given permission to go out of Arafah. While you're in Arafah, that's the main pillar of Hajj. You pray to Allah. You can rest, you can eat, you can sleep a little bit, you can read Quran, make istighfar. But then make sure the time especially any time, but that time of Asr, that Asr time before Maghrib, you get out there and you raise your hands and you pray to Allah. And like I said, make dua for yourself, your family, your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, your masjid, your community, the Muslim Ummah, and yours truly if you can. Make that dua. Subhanallah, oftentimes it'll rain on us. It'll be super hot, sunny, until that moment after between Asr and Maghrib, and rain will come in Arafah on us. And you're making dua, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends this light rain on you. And it's just, it's a, it's a heartwarming experience. Allah Almighty descends to the lowest, to this earth. And Allah jalla wa'ala, yaliqu bi jalali wajhihi wa azimi sultani. And he tells to the malaika, do you see my servants? They have come from every far away place on this earth. They're seeking my forgiveness. Look at them. Shu'than ghubra. They're dusty. Their hair is all over the place because they've traveled long distances, that is. I forgive all of them. I forgive all of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among them. Maghrib comes, we don't pray Maghrib in Arafah, we exit to Muzdalifa after Maghrib. Usually you're taking the train. It'll drop you off in Muzdalifa with your group leader. You go to Muzdalifa, first thing you do, if you didn't already make wudu, I would recommend you make wudu before you leave. But say you needed to make wudu, you go there, you make wudu, you pray in jama'ah with your group, or join if there's a jama'ah already started, pray Maghrib and pray Isha. Maghrib and Isha, back to back, jama'ah. And then after that, collect your stones. How many stones should you collect? Collect 70, but have extra. Take a few extra just in case you drop some. And if, even if you drop some, you can get some from anywhere. It doesn't have to be Muzdalifa. But recommended is from Muzdalifa. Take 70 stones with you, even if you're only going to throw 40, 49 for the ta'jeeb. 70 stones, eat, relax, get some rest. You can make istighfar and dhikr of Allah. You should remember Allah all throughout the journey. It is sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu to stay in Muzdalifa till when? Fajr prayer. Till when? Fajr prayer. You pray Fajr and go. Sometimes there are special circumstances and they will have you stay, spend a little bit of time and go. That's for a different opinion for people that are elderly, sick, fragile, things like that. But if you're healthy, we usually stay till Fajr. Right after Fajr prayer, you rush to the train with your 70 stones or more. And the stones should be the size of like a chickpea. Chickpea, huh? not stones. Stones. And you go to the train station, ride the train, it drops you off at, in, in Mina. And you walk, 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 and you go to the last Jamra. There are three. One, two, three. First, middle, last. Sometimes they call it big one. Middle one, small one. You go to the big one, and what do you do? You throw seven. What do you do? Bismillahi wallahu akbar. Bismillahi wallahu akbar. And try to hit that wall. Bismillahi wallahu akbar. Bismillahi wallahu akbar. Seven times. The, that's the day of Eid. Eid al-Adha. July 9th, I think, this year. Right? July 9th, inshallah. Or 10th? La, la, la. Not 8th. Ninth. You're using Apple. Apple is off. The Apple calendar. Why do I have to ask? It's right here. July 9th. Insha'Allah. Al Jazeera. You go to the day of Eid, you have four things that you should do. Four things you should do. A'mal yawm nahr Four things. The first one is you throw the seven pebbles at the jamra, al kubra. Fair enough? That's number one. What's the second? You cut or shave your head or clip your, your hair for the sisters. That's the second. Third one, you remember when I said if you do umrah and hajj, right? You're all going to do umrah and hajj inshallah. Correct? Whether it's with one ihram or two ihrams, both of those, they must do hadi. You have to sacrifice at least one sheep per person. Okay, your company should pay that for you. You should pay it up front and they'll have someone sacrifice on your behalf. So the sacrifice, sacrifice of hadi, throwing the pebbles, cutting the hair, these are three. The fourth one is tawaf al-ifadah. That is a pillar of hajj. Pillar of hajj is tawaf Al-Ifada and Sa'i. For those that are non muqrid Tawaf and Sa'i. You must do that. If you miss a pillar of Hajj, your Hajj doesn't count. Let me say this again. You miss one pillar of Hajj. These are musts. Your Hajj doesn't count. So when I say pillar, you pay attention. Ihram is the first one. We did our Umrah. We're done with that. Arafat. Okay. The tawaf of ifadah on the day of Eid, seven times around the Kaaba, just like Umrah, seven times around the Kaaba and seven times between Safa and Marwa for Mutamatta. Fair enough? And 
uh, and Arafah. So Arafah we finished. The Ihram, we, we done Ihram, we've gone to Arafah, you've done the Tawaf, Al-Ifadah and Sa'i. So it doesn't matter in any order. So the day of Eid, let me repeat the things you have to do. You throw the seven pebbles, you cut your hair, you sacrifice the animal, if you're mutamatta' or muqrin, and the tawaf and sa'i. These are the four things. If you do any three of the four, in any order, doesn't matter. Complete flexibility. If you do any three of the four, then you can no longer have to wear the haram clothing. But there's one restriction. This is called tahallul asghar. Pay attention to this because your hajj can really go away by not paying attention to this. And we've had people do this. If you do three out of the four activities on the day of Eid, then you no longer have to wear the clothing of ihram. You can do regular clothing and you can do regular scented everything. The only restriction is intimate relation. What's the restriction? Intimate relation until you do the fourth one. After you're done with all four, the pebbles, cutting of the hair, the sacrifice and the tawaf and sa'i of ifada, then khalas, no more restriction. You can have intimate relations, no problem. The mistake some people unfortunately make is they will do the three, they see everybody wearing regular clothes, they wear regular clothes, and suddenly they take their wife or husband and they go to their hotel room, and guess what happens? No, not that, the hajj. What happens is, their hajj is void. There's no solution to it. Void. And they must finish the hajj rituals, whatever is remaining is sitting in ayam al-tashriq. And then they must sacrifice a camel each. And then they have to come next year and perform hajj again. And the first one didn't come. Do you understand when I say pay attention is important? So no intimate relations until you do all four things. If you do three and you forget and you do the... You break the, you do the intimacy thing, your hajj is void, you penalize the camel each, you finish hajj and you don't get the ajr for it, and next year you must perform hajj again. That's 40k, 40K a person, that's a problem. So don't do that. And two years in a row, vacation time gone. So please pay attention to that. After we're done with those, you remain in Mina for three, two or three days. So you stay the first, the tenth day, the eleventh day, and twelfth day. You can leave after that if your group tells you to leave, your group leader, or if they choose to stay the full time. Al Hajj wa Shurum Malumat, Wal Kurullah fi Ayam in Madudat, Feman Tajela fi Yomani Fela Ithma Alay, Woman Taakhor of Fela Ithma Alay, Limanitak. So therefore, you will have the option of staying the full three days or two days in Mina, after the day of Hajj, Ayam al-Tashriq that is, and every day you will go and throw seven in the small one, seven in the big one, seven in, I mean middle one and then big one, and you will throw those pebbles. What do you say when you throw it? Bismillahi, wallahu akbar. Bismillahi, wallahu akbar. Bismillahi, wallahu akbar. Seven times. And then you walk between the first th stoning and the second stoning, you face the Kaaba. And you'll see where the Qibla is. And you say, Allahumma ja'alhu hajjam mabroora wa sa'yam mashkoora wa dhambam maghfoora. Oh Allah, make it an accepted hajj. Oh Allah, accept my effort. And oh Allah, forgive my sins. And you continue to the next one. You do that between the first and second. And after the third one, you just go back to your, to your camp. Three days after you're done with all the, the nights of tashriq or ayyam al-tashriq in Mina, then you go to the haram with wudu and you make the farewell tawaf. For hajj, it's wajib to do farewell tawaf. For hajj, farewell tawaf is a wajib. If you don't do it, you must sacrifice an animal. So pen penalties if you don't do certain things. The main things are the pillars. Those are non-negotiables. Ihram, Arafat, tawaf al ifada Sa'i. The rest are wajibat, and there are some sunan, and I explain to you basically 
in general. You do the Umrah, four pillars, what are they? Four pillars of Umrah, what's the first one? Ihram. What's the second one? Tawaf. What is the third one? Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. What's the fourth one? Right? Okay. Hajj. We have Arafat, Ihram. Arafat. We have the Tawaf and Sa'i of Al Ifada. And Inshallah, inshallah, you, you're good from there, inshallah. Those are the main pillars. The rest are wajibat and sunan. And I hope we have an idea of what hajj is about. And when we're stoning, it's not just uh, throwing pebbles. This is for you to be reminded. If I'm with you, inshallah, I will tell you at each station and explain some things to you. It's about you rejecting the shaitan and it's, it's uh, yani, uh, whispering. Ibrahim alayhi salam was told to sacrifice his son Ismail alayhi salam ala nabina salatu was salam. And the shaitan came to him and told him not to obey Allah. And he rejected the shaitan. This is symbolic for us to in spirit reject the shaitan when we come back to our homes here. Hajj is not just being ritualistic there or religious there. It's about carrying the spirit here. And have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervening with his miraculous interventions as he did for Hajar alayha as-salam. So when you're there going between Safa and Marwa and begging Allah, oh Allah give shifa to my daughter or my son or my father or me, oh Allah give me guidance, oh Allah protect us, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel alayhi salam in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere and saved this lady and her son alayhi salam. So when you're making dua, you really have the spirit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering you and miraculously intervening. So this is in a nutshell, some ideas about hajj. One thing I forgot to mention, especially for the brothers, this is the difference between misery and happiness. I don't advertise for these products, but I know they work. This is an anti-chafing stick. It's called Body Glide. It is scent-free, this blue one. And I would strongly, not strongly, I would heavily <laughs> recommend that you buy one or two of these sticks and keep them in your, you can buy them from Amazon or any other store. You keep them in your bag. What this is for is you, um, this is made for marathon runners, people that run a marathon, so they don't chafe. Chafing means when your skin rubs against each other, it will make you miserable. It will ruin your hajj. So what you need to do is have this with you, whether you go to hajj or umrah, you put that on your inner thighs. Generously, you'll be able to do three hajjs and you will have no problem, inshallah. Um, I have room maybe for a couple of questions. And then we will end to pray maghrib. And inshallah ta'ala, I have a quick announcement to make for you. Any questions? Yes. Subhanallah. So in 2015, I came here to June 2016. So I didn't know this community at that time. So 2015, I was Imam in Columbus, and I was in Hajj. And I was blessed to do Hajj with Sister Shahla and her son, Sheikh Faraz. And um, there were about 900 people that died that year in a stampede in, a, in, a, in the camp next to us. And um, it was... Uh, it was a difficult time, but she remembers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us courage and we moved forward and we got things done safely, alhamdulillah. So, uh, but here's something some of you don't know, that on the day of Arafah, they sent me to the ladies' tent, the management. They said, Imam, go to that tent, it's full of ladies, make dua. <laughs> so I said, okay. I went there, prayed dhuhr and gave a khutbah and started to make dua. One of the people that were there, I didn't see her, I didn't know her, was Sister Shahla. And 
she said and made a dua, said, Oh Allah, send us an imam like him. This is 2015. June 2016, I was imam here. So don't underestimate the dua that's made in hajj. Don't. Wallahi, this is a true story. She's living right there and she knows. Is, is this correct, Sister Shala? Yes, I said I don't understand why we cannot get And Allah subhanahu sent me here. <laughs> Subhanallah. So dua is accepted, truly. Brothers, how many people are going to hajj this year? They've registered and they're going, inshallah, this year. Raise your hand. Brothers and sisters, raise your hand. All of you, Sister Farheen Bakali and Dr. S S Salim Bakali, they have a special gift packet for all the hujjaj that are going. This year, and if you know anyone that's not here, you may take a bag for them as well. She usually puts a lot of goodies that you need on the trip because, mashallah, they're experienced. And I was blessed to serve them in our last hajj. May Allah accept it from us. So she always prepares traditionally for all the hujjaj from Cincinnati. She prepares a bag for them to use while they're on hajj. Just remember her and her family in your dua. And remember all of us, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah give us the pure intention. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our sincerity in everything that we do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us healthy and wealthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us as his honorable guests in his house. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us to visit his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, the best of creation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us visit the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the best of human beings after prophets. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us our expenditure, our effort. May Allah give us health. May Allah give us energy. May Allah give us sincerity. May Allah give us wisdom. May Allah give us benefit. May Allah give us realization of the blessings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us and accept from us our hajj and make it a hajj mabroor. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us back with zero sins in our accounts and tremendous good deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve those good deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them from us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us Jannah, the true rewards of Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all Jannah. Oh Allah, many of us can and many of us cannot afford to perform Hajj. Oh Allah, many of us got the visa, many of us didn't. Oh Allah, accept from us our intention to perform Hajj. And oh Allah, give us the rewards and blessings of Hajj. Oh Allah, increase our wealth and preserve it. And oh Allah, bless our health and preserve it. And oh Allah, protect us from hypocrisy, protect us from misguidance, protect us from all that is harmful. Oh Allah, give guidance to all of our loved ones. Oh Allah, give shifa to all of our sick loved ones. And oh Allah, anyone in our community who's asking for dua, oh Allah, bless them. Oh Allah, give them shifa. Oh Allah, protect them. Oh Allah, guide them. And oh Allah, make us a prosperous, harmonious community and ummah. And oh Allah, protect all Muslims who are innocent and vulnerable. And oh Allah, protect all those who are being harmed and oppressed. And oh Allah, aid them and help them. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina a'adhaab al-nar wa adkhilna al-jannata ma'al abrar bi rahmatika ya azizu ya ghaffar wa salli allahumma wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyina wa habibina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in and brothers and sisters, inshallah, if we end up going to hajj together, I will be honored to serve you. If we don't end up going to hajj together, I am still available to you. You can text me, you can call me, WhatsApp, Viber, whatever, and I would always try to be, help you, inshallah, on your journey. May Allah accept from you, and inshallah, we perform adhan.